Hej. Stigende mængder af drivhusgasser som CO2 og vandrop i atmosfæren bliver ofte kædet sammen med et varmere klima af både politikere og medier. I mange år har der været en generel enhed om, at det netop er drivhusgasserne, som gør, at atmosfæren er varm nok og er behagelig til, at vi kan leve her på jorden. Jeg har i dag snakket med en australsk klimaforsker, som har udgivet en række publikationer, som har et andet syn på det hele. Velkommen til. Dr. Robert Holmes, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. I reach, reach out for you uh, because of you have an interesting theory and you happen to end up on the climate denial list because of that theory. theory. Uh, but bec- before we get into that, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, the name's um, Robert Ian Holmes. Um, yeah, I've been interested in um, climate change for probably I don't know, 25 years, 30 years maybe. Um, most of my working life, I've, I've done quite a few different jobs, but uh, I didn't actually attend university for the first time until I was 50, and I did a, a degree in astronomy, uh, and then I did a degree in mining engineering, then. Um, Uh, a master's in environmental engineering, then I did a PhD in uh, climate science slash mitigation um, and uh, was awarded that degree uh, in the middle of uh, 2019. Yeah, so that's a quick recap. All right. That theory, you, you published a number of uh, scientific paper of, of theory that contradicts the greenhouse theory. Can you please uh, try to explain to our viewers uh, what this theory is about? Okay, um, uh, it's a bit of a long story really. Um, I, I was sort of in the 80s, 1980s, I sort of believed the um, what the climate scientists were saying at the time, I, I didn't really take much notice. Um, and like everyone, I was I was kind of a scientist at the time, I was interested in astronomy all my life. I believed in science, the scientific method, and and um, I thought, well, what they were saying about carbon dioxide must be correct. Uh, that there's a greenhouse effect. The carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere is adding to the greenhouse effect and so uh, causing warming um, they didn't seem to be sure exactly how much they had a, a wide variety of uh, uh, ideas on that somewhere between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees for what they call climate sensitivity so what it really boils down to uh, is climate sensitivity. What, what is the climate sensitivity to, to a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And the average from IPCC reports is uh, 3 degrees centigrade. Now over the decades um, many papers were published which had lower climate sensitivities and It seemed to me that over the last so 15 years or so, uh, they seem to be getting lower. Uh, some down one degree, some half a degree, some even less. Yeah, it was really when I heard Piers Corbin say that there's no such thing as a greenhouse effect and carbon dioxide doesn't cause any warming. That's really when I began to think, well, could it be true? Um, really need to look into this a lot more you know substantially uh, and uh, research it a lot more to find out exactly uh, the, i looked through the ipcc reports and what they identify is just one climate cycle the schwab that's the only one the 11 year solar cycle which doesn't really do much, goes up and down every 11 years, about 0.1 degree difference from top to bottom in global temperature, so it didn't really make much difference. But when I looked through the literature, 
I discovered that there were at least 16 climate cycles. So the Schwab is just one of 16 climate cycles affecting our climate. Now the IPCC only recognised and only mentioned the one, as I said. So uh, it seems to me that this, there definitely was something very wrong there. Uh, that they weren't recognising climate cycles which definitely affect our climate. For example, um, the 61-year Yoshimura cycle which peaked in, in 1880, again in 1940 and again in 2002. And they seem to ignore that. Uh, there was a warming from 1910 to 1940 and again from 1975 to 2000. And the first warming, 1910 to 1940, they attributed that to natural causes. And the second warming, which was almost identical, from 1975 to 2000, they attributed that to um, the forcing from carbon dioxide, our carbon dioxide emissions, which really took off after 1950, really post-World War II. Uh, they couldn't attribute the 1910 to 1940 warming to CO2 emissions because our emissions were very low at that time. Then I started looking to uh, look into other things such as um, the ideal gas law and its relevance to uh, planetary temperatures and uh, published a paper in I think the first one was in December 2018 on the molar mass version of the ideal gas law. And that seemed to suggest that uh, planetary temperatures um, are not really determined by greenhouse gases, uh, but, but by something which is called in mining, I'm a mining engineer, uh, auto compression. So when there's a thick atmosphere, so over 0.1 bar, auto compression, that is gravity causes auto compression of the atmosphere forces the atmosphere down to the surface and whenever you've got a pressure of over like I said 0.1 bar 10 kilopascals if you like you automatically get convection and that is the primary method of heat transfer in, in the troposphere is convection uh, but in the upper atmosphere in the mesosphere and stratosphere yes um, radiative transfer of, of heat is, is the primary method of heat transfer, but not in the troposphere. When they're talking about uh, greenhouse effect, they're talking about radiation, they're talking about the properties of greenhouse gases. So, so what you're saying is that uh, the climate is depending on, uh, on the outer compression of the, of the gravity of the atmosphere, and then the, the heat is, is distributed by uh, convection. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's something in the atmosphere called yeah. the lapse rate. Okay. Um, so what, what the lapse rate comes from, uh, it comes from, um, it, it comes from um, potential, the potential energy of the atmosphere higher up. When it's convected down to the lower atmosphere, that converts some of that potential energy in the gas converts to uh, kinetic energy and what temperature is is temperature is just a measure of the average kinetic energy in the gas so that's why you've got um, a thermal gradient through the troposphere which leads to a thermal enhancement of the surface uh, there is probably no effect from greenhouse gases no anomalous effect but but uh, there is definitely, in, in thick atmospheres like Earth, Venus and Titan, there's, um, there's a thermal gradient through the atmosphere, through the troposphere I should say, from the, from the uh, tropopause downwards to the surface, which leads to a surface thermal enhancement. Now because the convection is continuous, the heating is continuous. Uh, and as I said, the temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy in the gas and the kinetic energy in the gas in the lower atmosphere is increased compared to higher up near the tropopause. So it's, it's that 
uh, convection at any one time 50% of the trop troposphere is rising and 50% of the troposphere is falling and so 50% of it is, is uh, this descending is warming and the 50% that's rising is cooling so uh, what you get higher up in the atmosphere is, uh, is a temperature of about 255 Kelvin which is predicted, is the, that's, that's the Earth's average temperature predicted by black body law but down on the surface we know that it's actually 288 Kelvin so there's 33 Kelvin uh, higher that you've got to explain somehow and in the 1980s they just simply assumed that it was caused by something called the greenhouse effect. This goes back to Arrhenius in the 1800s who put forward this idea of the greenhouse effect. But before him, before Sventi Arrhenius, there was James Maxwell. He's, he proposed the uh, ideal gas law and thermodynamics had a lot to do with thermodynamics. So really the cause of uh, planetary surface temperatures in thick atmospheres is thermodynamics and uh, not, uh, not due to uh, radiative effects or warming from greenhouse gases. So, so the changes we see like uh, in uh, annual yearly changes in temperature like uh, when we have the warm period and the cold period in the like if you go a little bit past history is is that due to uh, the change in the atmosphere's like uh, density and uh, molar mass or pressure okay what i what i um did with in my first paper was um I converted the ideal gas law into the molar mass version of the ideal gas law which is basically this simple formula here so it's temperature equals pressure divided by um, the gas constant times the density of, of the gas divided by the molar mass of the gas so these, these are averages so but also they can be specific so you can you can get the temperature let's say of the, the average over the whole earth um, by the average pressure 101.3 kilopascals over the whole surface of the earth how is the gas constant so that stays the same so 8.314 and the density about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter is the air density at the surface and the molar mass which is around about 28 for earth so um, when you calculate that out over the average on the surface of the earth you get 288 kelvin that's the temperature and you can do the same for a specific point in the earth's troposphere anyway really so let's take the south pole you can calculate use this to calculate the temperature the average temperature at the south pole which is minus it comes out as minus 49 centigrade but the, over, the average over the whole earth is plus 15 centigrade which is 288 kelvin right so it's probably better to talk in kelvin what causes the um, the very low temperature at the South Pole is this mainly it's the low pressure it's only about um, 68 kilopascals at the South Pole because it's so high it's so it's really the uh, d the height above sea level that causes the low pressure and the low pressure is what mainly gives you the low temperature at the South Pole so um, anyway this formula can also be used on, on any planet uh, uh, if you have a look at my papers you'll see that Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, um, Venus any planet basically with an atmosphere Earth, Titan uh, or, or Moon with a thick atmosphere so basically temperature you, you can say that temperature comes from three gas parameters of so pressure um, density and molar mass from those three so if, if you add a gas to the atmosphere let's say carbon dioxide uh, it's really how much gas you add not really 
which gas it is. It, it can be carbon dioxide, it can be oxygen, it can be water vapor, it can be nitrogen, whatever gas you add. It's only going to change the temperature in relation to its uh, how much it changes the partial pressure, uh, the partial density and the molar mass. So in other words, if you add a small amount of gas, relatively speaking, to the atmosphere, it's not going to make any difference to temperature, no measurable difference. So by changing, if we manage to change CO2 from 0.04% uh, to 0.08%, it's not going to make any measurable difference to the temperature, to the planetary temperature. The planet Venus is often used as an example of the greenhouse gas going crazy. So actually it's, it, it's not really, the, the, the principle in, on Earth about that theory is the same on Venus. Right. Um, yeah, they point at Venus because they think that there's a greenhouse effect on Venus. But there's no greenhouse effect on Venus and there's no greenhouse effect, or I would say greenhouse gas effect on Earth either. Uh, so the, the temperature on Venus has the same cause as the temperature on Earth, which is because the mass of the atmosphere, uh, convection, auto compression leading to convection, and the density uh, of the gas and the pressure. So you can see temperature really is a sort of a battle between pressure and density in, in thick atmospheres. Um, and uh, if you, if you, the lapse rate on Venus is quite similar to the lapse rate on Earth. It's about 7.7 7 .7 centigrade per kilometre. On Earth it's 6.5 centigrade per kilometre. Um, now, on, in my latest paper, I compared the atmospheres of Titan, Venus and Earth at one atmosphere of pressure. So you can find somewhere in those three, atmosphere, in those three atmospheres where there's one atmosphere of pressure or one bar, if you like. Uh, in, uh, in, in on Earth, it's at the surface, of course. On, on Venus, uh, it's about 49 kilometers above the surface. And the temperature there, 49 kilometers above the surface, has been measured by various landers, um, various spacecraft going through the atmosphere, as being 340 Kelvin. Now, uh, <coughs> 340 Kelvin, Kelvin exactly relates to Earth's 288 Kelvin at one bar through through the insulation. So. If you look at the relative insulation between top of atmosphere insulation between Earth and Venus, the, the relative insulation difference is 1.91. So Venus has 1.91 times the insulation, top of atmosphere insulation that Earth has. And uh, the quaternary um, root of that will give you the temperature on Earth. So <coughs> I'll just quickly draw. Uh, another formula which will explain that probably better this formula here now that the quadruple root comes from black body law so so in other words the temperature on Venus equals a uh, quadruple root of 1.91 which is the insulation difference how much solar energy Venus receives more than Earth, 1.191 times, 1.91 times more. If you multiply that by the temperature on Earth, the average temperature on Earth, which is 288 Kelvin, uh, you work, if you work that out, you'll find it, it comes to 339 Kelvin. And 339 is the temperature on Venus at one bar. In the atmosphere, in the Venusian atmosphere. So, in other words, at a height of 49 kilometers. So the um, the two are exactly related through solar insulation and pressure alone. So, at the same pressure on Earth and Venus, the temperatures are exactly the same. Only only depending on solar energy insulation, nothing else. So, the greenhouse gas differences between Venus and Earth. Um, and even the albedo differences between Venus and Earth have made no difference to the temperature. 
Only the insulation, the solar energy coming from the sun has made a difference to the temperature. Uh, Venus has 96.5% of greenhouse gases. Earth has 2.5% greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in the troposphere. So there's a massive difference between Earth and Venus in terms of greenhouse gases. Uh, and Titan has 2.7% greenhouse gases. The albedos of Venus and Earth are again very different. Earth 30% albedo, Venus 70%. Uh, so even though the greenhouse gas contents of the atmospheres uh, and the albedos are very different, as you see in my last paper, my 2019 paper, um, on these three planetary bodies, um, the temperature is related exactly uh, through insulation at the same pressure in the atmosphere. It's the same for Titan. You can, you can calculate the Earth's temperature from Titan or from Venus. Just measure the, measure the temperature in Titan or Venus at one atmosphere at 101.3 kilopascals. And when you factor in um, solar insulation, uh, the difference using that formula you'll find the earth's temperature so you don't need to uh, discover what's in the earth's atmosphere you don't even need to go to the earth's atmosphere you don't need to check what gases are there mm. you know from that from a measurement on venus or from titan whichever you can calculate the earth's surface temperature from those planetary bodies so all you need is to find that out is pressure and uh, solar insulation. So that means that if we, let's say, we found an a, a undiscovered planet on the solar, on, in our solar system, we are able to calculate the average temperature on, on that planet at one bar just for the information we, we have, uh, like distance from the sun and... Yes, basically... Um, as long as there's no massive internal uh, cause of heat um, from that planet, then all we need is a thick atmosphere on that planet and to know the difference in distance between Earth or Venus from, that, uh, from the Sun and that planet from the Sun, the relative difference. And you can calculate the temperature in that planetary atmosphere at one bar. So that, that is, um, that's regardless of what the uh, atmosphere is made of. So in other words, it doesn't matter how much greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere. This tells you that there's no greenhouse effect, no greenhouse gas effect. There's, there's no such thing as a separate class of gases called greenhouse gases, which, which can cause unusual or I would mm. call it anomalous warming. But how about water vapor? Does it does any changes in the atmosphere? That oh, water vapor. Water vapor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, water vapor. Um, water vapor will uh, be, because it's there's quite a lot of water vapor compared to carbon dioxide. Um, it will affect temperature through the molar mass um, because the molar mass of water vapor is 18. Oh. Whereas the average for the atmosphere on Earth near the, is, is 28. So it's going to lower the molar mass. The more water vapor you add to our atmosphere, uh, the more you're going to uh, lower the average molar mass in the atmosphere. Because water vapor can be 1 or 2% uh, in the atmosphere, whereas carbon dioxide is much lower. It's measured in hundredths of 1%. So it doesn't affect... Um, temperature as much through through molar mass so if you add a lot of water vapor to the atmosphere um, it should actually lower the temperature of the atmosphere because it will lower the molar mass which tends to in in the formula I showed you first oh. that tends to lower the temperature but there are but when you're talking about water vapor, water vapor yeah quite a, yeah quite often you're talking about clouds when you're talking about water vapor so if there's a lot of clouds clouds can reflect solar energy and so cool the earth so that's that's uh, that's also an effect mm. very strong effect of clouds 
in the in the past history, like uh, Roman the Roman period and Middle Age period, and uh, all the cold uh, Dark Ages is is due to a uh, change in uh, climate cycles. Yeah, this is climate cycles. Um, the main climate cycle you're talking about there is the Bond, which is a thousand year cycle. Uh, it roughly, you could say, peaked in the Minoan period and again in the Roman period, then again in the medieval warm, warming period, and then again now in the current warming period. So this is, this is a 1,000 year uh, climate cycle. It's rising at the moment, so it's underpinning everything. Uh, so I don't think I don't think we'll get um, a large drop off in temperature in the next 50 years that people, are t uh, solar people are talking about might happen. I don't think that's going to happen because the climate is underpinned yeah, by a lot of by these longer term climate cycles. There's also um, Gleisberg, which is an 88 year cycle, and Yoshimura, which is a 60 year cycle. Now, the, the Yoshimura rose from 70, 1975 to with the present, and we're sort of on a high with the Yoshimura. Um, there's also several other uh, climate cycles yeah. that are sort of peaking at the moment. So, you don't see any uh, cold period or maybe just a flat trend in the temperature? Looking at the climate cycles, uh, I don't think we're going to see warming in the twenty in this century, in the twenty first century. Um, it will be. It might it might uh, go a little bit cooler towards twenty fifty sixty, and then probably rise again mm. towards the end of the century. I don't think it's going to be a, a strong rise or fall in either direction this century. This theory you come up with, uh, how how did it how did the science community receive it? Um, yeah, I've had some some good support. Um, I mean, I'm, on my YouTube channel, I've had about ten million views over the years. I've been on there about eight nine years, uh, and I've had some good, some bad. I've, uh, I've had a lot of bad reactions from, especially from climate activists, uh, a lot of threats of violence and so on. Uh, I had, I had some, um, I had a mob planning to attack me at one time, uh, so I had to take legal action in that case. But as soon as they go before the judge, you know, they, they seem to turn to water these people. Yeah, but I've had some of them say that, you know, you're worse than Anders Breivik, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's not good out there, especially on Twitter and on YouTube. Uh, it, it is quite bad uh, to, have a di to have a different opinion on science, yes, on, on climate. Did it, did it uh, surprise you that you get this kind of reaction? It did a little bit, it did a little bit, yes. Uh, I thought that uh, people would um, discuss things. Uh, science is something you should check and recheck, and uh, every idea, every hypothesis that's put forward has to be, um, you know, uh, checked by other people. And uh, there shouldn't really be this kind of politics involved in it. It's a pity that it's happened, but uh, yeah, when I when I published uh, my my papers, yeah. my three climate papers, um, I was lecturing at the university at the time, and uh, they basically mm. let me go. So um, uh, last year, I uh, I was basically fired from my job. Uh, but I'm not alone, there's, there's quite a few others, even just in here in Australia, there's quite a few others, you know, Professor Bob Carter, Professor Murray Salby, Professor Stuart Franks, you know, there's, there's quite, a, quite a few more as well that I can think of, that have been fired, the papers they publish which go against the grain, sort of thing. I suppose it matters more to the younger yeah, people, who, you know, if you're young, you've got a mortgage, you've got a family to support, then you'd probably toe the line uh, as far as uh, climate science goes. But if you're a bit, 
bit older like me, you don't care. You uh, you just go with the flow, and uh, yeah, that's mm. things that happen. The science has been uh, influenced by politics for quite quite some decades. Uh, when when did you see this coming? When did you, did you see this turn, like from real, as you call it, real science, until like but political science? When when did it when did this, did this happen? Yeah, I think really it was after Climate Gate, wasn't it? When uh, mm -hmm. when the emails came out and we found out how we found out how really dodgy the science is, um, and how they were um, suppressing any alternative papers that they didn't like. There's a, there's only a very small number of scientists that that are uh, involved in this. There's about only thirty or forty, really, when you think about it. It's not that many. Uh, those that are working on attribution at the IPCC, there's only a handful of them, and uh, they seem to be, you know, um, dictating yeah. world energy policy at the moment, which is a bit frightening, really. Uh, I mean, there's windmills and solar panels going up everywhere, yeah. costing a lot of money, uh, very, very inefficient. Actually quite bad for the environment because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, toxic metals have to be mined to make these uh, windmills and solar panels so it's not that environmentally friendly especially if they're cutting down whole forests so that they can erect uh, wind farms such as they are in like they are in scotland for example okay. yeah i i think that um you know when you look at the west um the West are having to cut their emissions because of the climate Paris Agreement, uh, Paris Climate Agreement. But uh, the the so-called developing countries don't have to cut their emissions, and they're actually their emissions are actually larger than the West at the moment. They've grown larger. By far, the biggest emit yeah. emitter of carbon dioxide is China. Um, more than double the next biggest yeah. emitter, which is the United States. The United States, even though it hasn't been in the Paris Climate Agreement, its uh, its emissions have fallen quite substantially by about 1 billion tonnes per year. Hmm. So even though total global emissions of carbon dioxide, uh, anthropogenic human, is about 38 billion tonnes per year, um, natural emissions of carbon dioxide are about 770 billion tons per year so our human emissions are only about five percent of of uh, all carbon dioxide emissions uh, and about half of that is uh, is taken up by the oceans and by plant life um, because of the excess carbon dioxide that there is in the atmosphere excess over you know what there has been for the last few decades so um although when you look back on the historical record uh over millions of years the carbon dioxide level now is actually very low historically compared to the past so it's almost the lowest it's ever been virtually in the earth's history but i don't think it's something we need to worry about uh, the carbon dioxide level is basically an effect of temperature so when the temperature goes up and down carbon dioxide goes up and down afterwards so it's not that carbon dioxide is is causing the temperature go, to go up and down it's the reverse it's that the temperature causes carbon dioxide levels mm. to go up and yeah. down and it's basically always been yeah. been like that throughout the uh, throughout the uh, proxy records that we look at but Let's let's say we, we find all the fossil fuels we can find and burn it all. Like would we be like as a human we would we be able to release enough enough carbon dioxide to change the molar mass and density enough to 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 affect the, the temperature? Like if we uh, use your your theory about the the auto combustion, uh, would would we be able to do that? No. Uh... It will not make a measurable change to planetary temperatures. So no, no matter what we do, uh, like uh, we burn it all and and uh, get crazy like China, then uh, it, it doesn't have any effect. Even like we reach like 800 parts per million. 
800 parts per million, uh, no, it wouldn't make any difference. It, there'd be no measurable difference to global temperatures. Of course, if apart from CO2, we're talking about CO2 now, uh, but with CO2 comes might come pollution. If you're burning fossil fuels, that that is something we need to seriously, you know, cut down as much as possible. Uh, in particular, um, the noxes and soxes that they talk about that c that come out of um, uh, fossil fuel power st power stations. I mean, China is globally about 1,200 large uh, coal-fired power stations are being are under construction right now uh, about 12 to 1500 are, are either being built or in the you know late planning stages um, so um, that is going to raise um, co2 emissions uh, but if if you have the correct controls on the power stations like we have in the west largely uh, then you do control the dangerous pollutants such as the noxes and soxes and the particles that you have to control uh, i'm not saying there's no anthropogenic effect on climate whatsoever but there isn't through carbon dioxide or methane or other so-called greenhouse gases but mm. there could be some anthropogenic effect on the climate through pollution yeah. Uh, real pollution that yeah. is uh, uh, black yeah. carbon for example yeah. if there's if there's a lot of black carbon coming out of china and india it's mm. going to settle on uh, on snow for example greenland mm. it's going to settle on the arctic and that's going to cause melting some melting mm. so that uh, but although it'll only be temporary but but that is something that we really need to control more than carbon dioxide itself but I guess we have the technology to to be able to remove all the particles and pollution. Uh, but I guess in the in the poor countries, developed countries, they maybe not want or have the funds to to implement that, that kind of technology. So, uh, you have any more plans for like future release, like scientific papers or? No, I don't think so. Um, I've no plan at the moment for another paper. I might. I, I'm in the late stages of writing a book, which might come out. So uh, if I can um, stop being so lazy and get on, get it finished. It's about 95% finished. So I've just got a few weeks oh. of work to yeah. do, and then it'll be finished. <laughs> but as far as papers, now I've no plans for another paper at the moment. Um, where can people find your your work? Um, my YouTube, which is 1000 Frawley, uh, PhD, or you can follow me on Twitter. At the moment, I'm still there. <laughs> I've been trying to get on Parler, but uh, that's been shut down, mm. unfortunately. Uh, so they're, they're trying to stop any any form of free speech by anyone, basically on the right at the moment, uh, which is also very disappointing, but uh, I'm sure Paolo will get going sooner or later and perhaps some other uh, competition for Twitter. And we will link a description below. And Dr. Robert, uh, thank you very much for talking to us. I appreciate it. No worries. Thanks, Ricky.